perspective, typically, you know, they come to us with a business problem, and then we're the ones applying technology to it. And what's great about that is we see this, this broad range of business problems, of technologies, and, and, uh, and such, and it gives us a lot of insight and, and a lot of uh, varied exposure. And one of these projects that we did, um, I guess we started on this a little bit over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, really kind of stood out because um, it had some aspects to it that you know, in the requirements and in the commercial, not just the technical requirements, but the commercial environment, were at odds with each other. And, and it required us to take a different approach architecturally. And, and that's kind of what spawned this whole idea that, you know, hey, this might be kind of interesting to share. Um, it, it, you know, it's nothing, I don't think anything terribly revolutionary, but I think there are some lessons and maybe some ideas in here that, that are applicable and that, that could be applied. And so, um, uh, that's the genesis of where this came from. And really to start out on it, I'd, I'd like to give you a background, give you, you know, a better description of the client's problem, the business problem they came to us with. Um, and, and this is a startup company, fairly small, but with uh, some very experienced people who work, work in a very specific domain. And what they're doing as a business, right, to, to, to differentiate themselves from their competitors, is they're relying on data analytics. They're, they're, they're doing a better job, and their, their vision is to do a really good job of analyzing certain data sets so that they can identify business opportunities and that will put them ahead of their competitors, and give them a competitive advantage. Um, so uh, because they're a bunch of analysts and, and very data-centric uh, people, um, they're, not, they're not software technology people. Uh, they've developed a whole process that's, that's really heavily built around Excel. And you know, any, anyone who's worked in, in uh, consulting, right, or any, any kind of business consulting, knows that there's just a ton of business processes out there implemented in Excel. And moving them from Excel to any kind of like, more formal process is, is a challenge. And that, that, this fits this whole, that whole space. So their analytics process starts out with uh, a commercial data set that's hosted on the cloud, and the vendor of this data set provides them a desktop tool. And that desktop tool is intended for you know, a fairly large uh, customer base globally to download data and do analysis within that tool. And it does have a data export capability as well. So what this client realized is that um, yeah, there's some limited analysis they can do within this tool, but if they use the tool to select out of the data set, you know, and, and, and the cloud-hosted data set is terabytes, but to do any particular analysis, they're looking at tens of gigabytes, typically. Um, and they realize that, well, you know, if they just use the export function, start with the raw data, layer their own analytics in on top of it, right? And, and I'm grossly underestimating the number of analytics transformational steps here. Um, when, when the client tried to describe this problem space to us, uh, they showed up at our office with these, these big plotter-sized printouts that they rolled out on tables, and it was all flow charts of data moving. And it, it took, I think, it was a half-day session with several of their staff trying to explain to us how this all fit together, right? Fill the table, it was, it's a massive process. Um, but coming out of this process, they, they get these, these results, which are basically identified business opportunities. Okay? And that's the job that one of their data analysts do. They then have a number of data analysts that repeat this. Okay, so if you, if you think about this, you know, there's a huge amount of work going on in parallel. Uh, a lot of data duplication downloaded through this tool, a lot of these analysis steps. Um, and so it, it kind of, you know, automatically, just as developers, you know, we're, we're very accustomed to finding those ways to, so that we don't repeat ourselves, so that we, we, you know, we do things in an optimal way. It kind of gives you insight into the, the technical goal, right? Really, the customer came to us wanting to uh, increase th their efficiency of doing the analysis. Um, and, and, you know, like anything else, it's, it's about using their human capital better. Right? If there's a number of kind of um, 
programmatic steps or predictable steps, they don't want to have people doing that. They, they want people to apply judgment, apply judgment to the data, and then come up with you know, better uh, analysis and better outcomes. Um, the, the interesting thing from a business perspective, and, and, and this plays into the architecture and some of the competing forces, is that their goal wasn't strictly to reduce um, manpower, right? They're not looking for a way to reduce costs or cut staffing. They, have, they know that the, the, the analysts and the type of analysis they're doing is very, it, first of all, there's a limited number of people capable of doing them, doing it. It requires a fair bit of uh, domain knowledge and training. Secondly, when they do identify a business opportunity as a result of these analytics, there, there are certain commercial constraints around how many of these business opportunities they can, they can pursue, right? They can't scale the business as they identify more opportunities. So what they're really looking to do is to run more analysis um, variants, right? So that they can identify better opportunities. So that they're still coming out with the same number of recommendations for the business to move on in terms of in terms of um, opportunities, but they're, they're analyzing a larger set of data, a larger number of cases, so that they have a higher probabilistic outcome right, of success at the business level. Um, so that's also interesting, right? That it's not about reducing human capital costs. Uh, it is about increasing their efficiency and increasing the ability to apply human judgment to the problem. Um, and, um, you know, and then ultimately, they did have the stated goal as well of, you know, well, you know, machine learning, AI, I, mean, I think every, it's on every uh, executive's radar that there's got to be some way we can apply that to our business. Um, so we kind of put that, that specific one out of our mind. Um, I've already alluded to constraints on the business side. And I don't know, maybe the use of handcuffs, maybe that's a little bit harsh <laughs> as, as, a, as an indicator of constraints uh, for the business. But, but in this case, it was, it was very interesting when we spoke to the management team that um, like, like all you know, management teams, they want to spend their, their, their money wisely. Uh, they, um, they want to see return on that investment. Um, but because it was a small company, Right? There's also, and I really like working with smaller companies because there's, there's a really tight connection between the technology side and the business side, right? And you get really direct connection to the, um, the business owners and the, 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 the people who are driving that business and responsible for founding it. Um, but a, a really big risk that we identified early on is that this client had absolutely no exposure to custom software development. Right? And, and you, could, you could see that in that all of the processes they had developed were built in Excel. It was all kind of, you know, um, it worked, but it was all kind of cobbled together. And even the folks, the analysts on their side, the data analysts, were, were really domain experts, right? They had no formal data analytics training, data science training, right? They were just, they, they understood the domain. Um, they were comfortable working with CSV data, and so therefore they're comfortable with Excel. Um, and so the whole, you know, thought of moving this to any kind of uh, uh, formalized, you know, uh, software program or some, something that was more rigid in its process or, or uh, captured, if you will, the, uh, you know, the algorithmic aspects of it was kind of foreign to them. Um, and as a result of that, right, the management on a timeline basis, they really wanted to see results quickly, right? They, they wanted to know that, hey, as I'm spending money, I'm actually seeing some, some results from this and some benefit. Um, there was a little bit of an analysis, uh, evolution of their analysis happening as well, right? But it was very clear that they, at points, needed to be able to still, they were still working on the an analysis process and that there would need to be some flexibility there. So, um, you know, we, we build lots of solutions, different technology platforms, um, mobile, web, you name it. So, you know, it's pretty obvious to us what, what the ideal architecture should be, right? And if it's driven by uh, 
just, just looking at the requirements, right? Multi-user, um, a single kind of set of um, uh, artifacts that, that were managed, um, having an audit trail, having the whole analysis process conform to uh, a predefined step-by-step um, uh, -step process, right? We really should be looking at, at a web-based approach um, so that the an analyst, analysts are working on kind of the same underlying data set. They're not replicating it, right? There's business logic that, it, that encapsulates all of the rules and the kind of interpretation that they're doing. Um, all, of, all of the good stuff you would, you would associate with, you know, just kind of proper end-tier architecture in, in, a, in a, a modern web application. From a graphics point of view, I mean, there are definitely some aspects of, uh, you know, Excel uh, that, that would have to be implemented. But this is pretty easy with uh, components off the shelf, right? Grids and a bit of SVG graphics and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the challenge with this, when we looked at it, and we did our analysis around effort and, you know, looking at um, if we built that architecture, put it in place, you know, does, does it solve the customer's problems? I mean, well, yes, it solves the ultimate problem once it's implemented. Challenge is that the customer has so many analytic steps, right? And, and they have to go through all of those before they get any of the output. We would have to codify and encapsulate all of that in the business logic, right? Just getting them to explain the process on, you know, on paper was a half day process. Now getting them to uh, go through all the requirements, the edge cases, um, codifying it, tests, right? All of that. We knew it would be, it would be a very you know, significant uh, delay, if you will, calendar effort, calendar duration, before enough of the system was built, or actually in this case, we felt we would have to build all of the analysis steps into it, right? Before they could put that web app into production and actually see a business benefit coming out of it, right? And, you know, our sense coming out of this is that although that's the right technical approach and would result in a solution that fit all of their requirements, it would, it would fall flat in the face of what the business was looking for. And a lot of that had to do with the, if you will, the maturity of the business, right? Their unfamiliarity with, with software development, um, web, you know, they really had no idea what, um, you know, what technology platform to use, um, uh, hosting, they weren't running any infrastructure internally in terms of database or web servers, they, um, I'm not even sure they, they, they had, I think they had some, they might have had Office 365 for, you know, some cloud hosted email, and that was kind of the extent of their, if you will, their technology uh, knowledge, right? So our options at this time were, well, um, you know, keep looking, try to find a way to, to do a phased release within that ideal architecture. And really, you know, we looked at it several times and we just could not find a way to phase it um, that would not require a significant, still a significant calendar delay before the business could see benefit. Um, Another option was just to stick to this whole kind of, you know, big bang release and just say to the client, like, that's the only option and uh, just be prepared to spend the dollars and have the delay and so on. And, you know, we're certainly prepared to do that and speak the truth to them that, you know, it's going to be a lot of cost and it will be a number of months down the road before you see any benefit. Um, the you know, the client, we could also, the client could also stick with manual processing, right? That's their call at the end of the day. If we present cost and timeline around our ideal architecture, it's really the client's decision. As long as we're truthful in that cost and, and timeline, we don't want to mislead them. Um, they, they could certainly just choose to stay with the manual approach. Uh, so we, you know, we decided to look at this internally and see, you know, is there a different way we could approach this, right? maybe changing the architecture a bit and coming at it from a different angle so that, uh, so that we could get some kind of incremental delivery to the business. <clears throat> and we, went, we circled back with the client, talked to them, and just to understand some of the business pressures a bit more, right? 
And what became clear was that although the client had this ultimate goal of, of wanting to automate the entire process, right, because they, they saw that fitting into um, you know, machine learning and all kinds of other great, you know, great benefits, the business would really see some benefit if they could see some reduction in processing time. Right? It didn't have to be the entire processing time reduced down and automated, but just some of it. Um, they also had some um, attached some value to flexibility and, and maintaining some flexibility in some of the steps, right? Not wanting to codify absolutely everything right from the get-go because they, they still had some, you know, their sense was that if some steps could be automated and reduce processing time, that might actually free up time to do a little bit more ad hoc analysis in some of the other steps, and that, that could actually be a benefit, a business benefit to them. So um, we kind of went back to the drawing board and um, came up with this other architecture where um, rather than having, if, so it starts with rather than having individual an analysts do this, you know, a download of a subset of data, uh, we were just going to have, you know, one person sit down and just grab the whole data set, just everything that could be, you know, select all kind of thing. Might take days to download or whatever, that's fine. Um, throw that in a shared folder, and it's really ugly because these come in as CSVs, so you can imagine, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of CSV files, right? It's just, there's thousands of files, it's ugly, right? But at least, at least this vendor solution named all the files um, uniquely, and it handled things like, you know, if you went back a month later and wanted to select that same data set, it, would, it, it knew about differences and would only download the files that had changed and keep the file names the same and that. So we, we kind of had a bit of a win there just in the way the vendor tool worked. Uh, we then built, uh, you know, proposed to the client, building this new, actually, we went ahead, we did this. This is a, a post analysis, so we, we did this. Uh, built this desktop tool that would then read from that, that network share, perform some of the analysis inside that tool, some of the common steps, and, and we, we, in analyzing all of their analysis steps, we discovered that there were some pre-steps that were fairly significant, right? I think out of the entire workflow, it maybe captured 10%, 10 to 15% of the steps, but it represented, you know, maybe a 20 to 30% portion of the time an analyst spent. So it was a pretty big value for the, you know, uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. Uh, but then what we did is that we had that desktop app write uh, process data and metadata back to that same file uh, share file, right, file share. Um, it meant that there was still some local processing that had to be done, but again, we reduced the size of that. And that then allowed you know, an analyst to pick up from there. So first analyst running through on some of the data, you know, they, they probably didn't see a lot of time savings. The desktop app was a little bit more tuned to what they were doing. They could certainly manipulate the data faster than they were in Excel. So there, there were some savings there. But a second order level of savings really came from you know, the analysts running in parallel because they now avoided this download step and all of the data prep. As soon as one analyst had touched one part of the data set that happened to overlap with what the other analysts were looking at, that data was, you know, was considered pre-processed and done and they could just pick up from there. And so even though, you know, th this is like looking at it from a, a physical architecture point of view, it, it seems a little bit, um, it, you know, it doesn't seem as advanced. It seems kind of like a step backwards in time, so to speak. Right? There was value to the customer. And so some of the benefits we saw, you know, was I think number one was that getting this in place was, was a much shorter step to get to something in place. But it, it provided a framework that we could then start layering in more and more processing steps and incrementally roll it out. Right? And, and one of the big benefits of that is it really shifted the mindset of the users, right? So we went, it was sort of like educating the users along the way, you know, where, where they went from having no experience with software development to now they started to see, right, firsthand the value of this incremental uh, delivery, incremental development. 
because we were able to then, then do, uh, you know, get on a release cadence with them where there were just a few more features, a few more features. As we rolled that out, the metadata become, became a little bit richer. There was a few more analysis done within the desktop app, pulled out of Excel, pulled back, right? And, and so they could, they actually started to get excited about seeing it, right? Oh, now we could do this, now we could do that, right? Um, it also had a benefit of fitting into their infrastructure in that there was no database to install or maintain, right? It was all file-based. Again, a little bit old school, kind of a little bit uh, backwards feeling, right? Um, and then, you know, of course, it, it got the business on side because the business was seeing, was hearing the feedback from the end users that, oh yeah, we are actually saving time, right? And the business was seeing that as they were spending money, they were getting this feedback and, and seeing benefit from it. So this, you know, that all sounds good, but from an architecture perspective, what, what does it mean, right? Because we've, we've gone from a physical architecture that's that's end tier and you know web and all the uh, fun stuff to work on to something that looks a little bit you know a little bit backwards right it's really if you kind of decompose this it's it's effectively a two tier architecture and um, you know for anyone who lived through that whole evolution from desktop apps to client server to end tier architecture right one of I mean, I mean that evolution happened for a reason. And as technology happened and as patterns and practices emerged, but one of the downfalls, maybe not downfalls, but a, a pattern that often happened and often presented itself in the, in the client server architecture, right, was there was this lack of separation of concerns. Um, you know, the IDEs of the day, you know, would, would have in your click handler for your, your button click, the, there'd be sample code that would show you making a database call directly from the UI layer, and right? There was just no layering in there. There was no formal separation. Um, there was no thought given to testability, to being able to mock components, inversion of control, right? All of the things that we do just kind of as a matter of course in, in our development today. Um, so we, we really wanted to, even though, you know, from a physical uh, architecture perspective, it was client server two tier. We wanted to ensure that we were setting a pattern and setting ourselves on a path to continue moving towards that ideal architecture, have that ideal architecture in mind. And uh, so if you look at the, the code we wrote, right, we were very careful to break it down into, uh, into tiers, very clearly separate out data access from business logic from presentation. Okay, sure, the presentation layer was not web. Uh, we used uh, WPF, desktop technology. Uh, that actually had some benefits in, in terms of speed. We could, um, you know, if you're, if you're building up, um, you know, anything web-based and you're going from your middle tier to your web service to data transfer objects to a DOM-based domain model and then doing binding to some SVG graphics, right? There's a bunch of steps in there just going straight desktop, right? It's graphics. You're just drawing straight to the canvas and done, right? So it allowed us to move very quickly on the, on the UI front. Um, and on the back end, um, you know, used all good practices, built some interface-based interface um, uh, implementations. Um, and we, we really, like we treated the CSV files, the, the source files as a data lake, built a data lake provider we treated the, uh, the JSON files as, as uh, metadata and built a you know, specialized metadata provider. And so you could see how these could be swapped out at a later point in time. And, and that's, that's really the whole goal of, of putting this together is that even though we start with a less than, maybe our suboptimal implementation under the hood, we're, we're designing it and architecting it in a way that, that keeps us on the path and moving towards that. Gives us lots of options, right? We could stick with the data providers and so on as, as they are, add in this whole automated download bit if, if that was a big deal to the client. It could stay manual, right? Um, we could replace the, the files on disk with data stores, right? Wh whatever might be appropriate, it might be uh, cloud-hosted data lake, it might, might be a NoSQL store for some of the, the source data, it might be document database, 
uh, might be a traditional uh, relational database for the metadata, right? But we have flexibility there in the architecture to move to that without having to completely you know, revamp uh, the entire implementation. And then on the front end of it, what we, what we are seeing, right, and this is a, still a project actively under development, is that uh, as, as our business logic layer builds out, right, we're encapsulating more and more of the data analytics and, and basically encoding more of the logic and the rules around that in the middle tier, right? That then sets us up for once it's entirely encoded, it's then a much simpler shift to move that front end over to web-based, right? And then, you know, you're arrived back at that ideal architecture, and now we have all the benefits of it, can deploy it, and so on. So, um, yeah. Good news is we'll have lots of time for questions and discussion or early lunch. But, uh, you know, some, some key points to take away, right? Um, we, we recognized up front that that ideal architecture wasn't commercially feasible, right? Even though it was technically the right way to go, there were some commercial realities around it. Um, found a way to implement a, sub, a, a significant enough portion of the features, right, that we could show business benefit and, and earn that trust and then continue down the path. Um, and, and I mean, we have, well, actually, okay, let me hold that thought for a moment. So the customer did see, uh, you know, a number of benefits uh, over and above that, right, in terms of that, that quicker delivery. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the big things, the big wins for me coming away from it was, you know, there's a whole bunch of users there in a company that's now much more up to speed. They understand what incremental development is all about, iterative development, incremental delivery, right? And that makes working with them in the future that much easier because now they understand that lingo, they understand the benefits when we, when we talk to them. Um, and it did also allow us to do some course corrections along the way, right? All of the benefits of, of iterative development. Um, so this all, you know, is, is, and again, framed from the perspective of a software services company, right? That, that you know, the one benefit of a, a software services company, the way we work on time and materials basis, right? We're very tuned into that feedback loop of, you know, uh, customer paying, um, work being done, value being delivered back, right? And, and really, it's the nature of that business, right, that, that kind of, drives us to be very sensitive to these, these concerns from the business perspective, right? So, so how does that apply if you don't work in a services business, right? You work for a product company, uh, independent consultant, um, whatever, right? Well, there, you do have a client, right? Um, one of the, and, and, and those business concerns, right? Timeline, budget, they're there, right? Guaranteed they're there. Someone's paying your salary. Someone cares about budget and timeline. Uh, challenge in, in many organizations, especially as you get to large organizations, right, a lot of those things aren't made transparent uh, to all people within the organization. You really don't have a good feel, right? We've, we've all kind of, well, hopefully not all worked on those projects. I, I've worked on those projects where, you know, you, you, here's your goals, here's what you need to work on. Yep, you work, 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 and then suddenly, you know, you get the memo that oh, you're over budget over time and now there's a massive change and a shift has to happen, right? You had no data coming into it beforehand to really uh, be able to adjust the way you're working. So I think there's, you know, there's a call, a call I'm kind of making two ways here. One is that um, as implementers, as developers, right, keep in mind who is it you're trying to make successful? What conversations can you have with them to help uncover some of those constraints around timeline and budget, and how can you help make them successful? Because if you make your boss and your boss's boss successful, right, that helps everyone. I'd also make a bit of a call to any, you know, anyone with responsibility and running a dev team, you know, that you have this obligation to, to try and to expose as much of this as possible to your dev team, um, because they'll come up with some great ideas. Right? If they just know the constraints, if they know the constraints you're working under and um, what matters to your success, right? give them the chance to come up with ideas, to propose new things, right? uh, you, you'd be surprised. So. 
So that's the end of that. So happy to uh, take any questions or chat uh, about any of this. So, yeah. If you had to guess how much longer or shorter do you think going this route would have been versus what you originally planned? Like mm -hmm. everything like that once. Yeah. Uh, we we had something out and working within uh, within two months, versus what we estimated to be a nine month, right? Right, but that would have so, been like a, a, just a section of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So if you had built out like the, the total, like, right? I see what you're getting. At. So the question is, taking this approach to build the complete feature set, right? right it would take longer, guaranteed, right? We we it would take longer. Uh, I would guess, probably, you know, thirty to fifty percent longer. Um, so it really, so in terms of total spend that the client's making, you know, with this incremental approach versus the, the big bang approach, they're spending more. However, there's some benefit in that they're seeing some business value along the way and there's more opportunity for course correction. So I would argue that even though the, the total cost will be higher at the end and timeline longer, it'll be better aligned to the business and they'll have a better uh, outcome at the end. The other benefit is that at, at those uh, incremental delivery points, they can stop, right? And, and that's what our client has done. Like, uh, at, they got to one point and they're like, wow, this really helps us. You know, we've, we've been able to save a bunch of time. We can do some extra analysis. We, need, we now realize we need to take a pause, right? Really think about this. Think about what our next step is. Prioritize the next step before moving on. So they took a pause. They came back to us a number of months later and then we continued on, right? So, um, yeah, there are pros and cons both ways for sure. Yeah. So, a excellent question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're preaching to the converted, but I, my experience has always been quite often, like, I think you probably said this, but the client really doesn't have a clear understanding of what they need when they start. So, delivering a, a, like a phase one, they also have such a crystal clear understanding of what they need at the, the end of that point. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely right on all points, and just um, I, I think being in the services business for as long as we have, that's what perhaps has also made us more sensitive to this, right? Because we've seen that that movie reel play out, right? That's exactly what I asked you to build, and now I realize that's not what I need, right? <laughs> that's very very common. Yeah, yeah. So, cool. There are Turn. increasing. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I, I would, I would agree, Jeremy. And I would think that, like, the, the type of analysis they're doing here, right? In some ways, they're a little bit locked in from the mindset and and um, their experience, right? Uh, as domain experts, but I would expect, and and actually, maybe you've got some commentary on this too, but that you should be able to do all of this with. Uh, you know, with a hosted offering, with, I mean, all of the transforms, all the pieces they're, they're doing, like there's nothing really rocket science in there, right? The, the real secret sauce is in their judgment around uh, the way that they're mixing the data, transforming it, and popping out with something. Right. Yeah. I guess what, I, what I'm curious about is uh, as that industry grows, as the data industry grows, does it change the way you perceive the architecture? Mm -hmm. like clearly you're doing that, but do you, do you, does that, has this project made you see the world differently? Um, I, I think it's, it, it's made us uh, understand the, 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 I don't know what the right word is, the, uh, you know, the, the length that, w that clients will go to from like, like you know, uh, Rube Goldberging pieces together, right? Like just how complex that can be and, and the lengths they'll go to, to to implement, you know, something that they feel is their secret sauce or that, it, that is very unique. How, um, 
you know, from a technology point of view and from that, that data analytics side, um, I don't think this alone has changed my view, but I think this in combination with uh, just, just the, the emergence of all of the hosted solutions, the analytics, visualization, and so on, right? I've, I've got to think that the ultimate solution really for this client is, is move away from, from this style, right? Uh, and the real holdup for them is, is that, that attachment to Excel, right? They're just so accustomed to, if I can get my data in Excel, I can copy it, I can reference it, I can, like, I can do all kinds of ad hoc things, and that is their ad hoc tool of choice. Right? So, yeah. Scott. Thanks. Um, that, that's always really interesting to hear your mm -hmm. stories and, and uh, experiences with particular projects. Um, either in this project or in general, my understanding you have experience with many projects. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had success with perhaps helping clients or, or these, these domain experts who the, the secret sauce, as you say, is in their understanding of the problem, um, the, the, the workflow that they have, just, just providing them with an incremental increase in their understanding of the tools that they already use or teaching them how to use another tool they might not be aware of that would help with their workflow so that they can maintain the ability to adjust ad hoc Right. Um, as a, uh, so, so the question uh, for folks uh, who didn't hear it was that, um, you know, as a company, have we had experience, um, correct me if I've got this wrong, if I'm, if I'm not uh, paraphrasing correctly, but uh, have we had experience just in helping clients, you know, um, understand what tooling is out there and maybe directing them to different tooling so that they could attack this problem differently? Um, and, and I would say that, um, that generally, the, you know, what I find is that the clients aren't aware that they need to learn those things until they have a problem like this. And it's actually walking down a path like this that helps them understand that, um, you know, what, what they don't know. Um, and we're, we're fortunate to, uh, uh, you know, to have uh, a few folks that, that, that we know around town um, Jeremy and the folks at Minome were, were able to direct some of those queries their way, and they, they really are experts in, in that sort of uh, tooling and, and those advances. Um, I tend to find the, you know, we see the Excel thing pop up just time and time again. Um, and what's different about this project is that this project is purely analytics. Typically what we see in the Excel solutions is it's, a, it's a, a departmental or some kind of workflow solution. And where the client typically runs into problem is not in trying to do the analysis any better, but they run into issues, uh, governance issues. You know, are we tracking changes to the formulas? Uh, do, are we auditing changes? Um, if the output is another Excel spreadsheet, right, are we collecting that in places in a standard format so that we can do analytics on the outputs, right? Um, I and got, so, I got a yeah. Data lineage. Data, yes. They all have yeah. data lineage problems. problems. Yeah, yeah. And and lineage around the you know the macros and the code that's within the spreadsheet, right? So a lot of times, when the clients run into a real um, you know business challenge with an Excel-driven process, it's not so much about the analytics, but it's about wanting to codify it so that they can do say appropriate regulatory reporting or SOX reporting, SOX compliance, right? That sort of reporting uh, around changes and around the lineage within that. So, yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Or are we? Lunch, that's what I'm, okay. Uh, I just started dabbling in Power BI for, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of clients have a lot of data that they, you know, I do reporting for them. And historically, they ask for the output to go into Excel, actually, right? <laughs> But it seems like Power BI for some users, and it sounds like maybe your client is one of these a very sophisticated power users type of people. They probably know Excel inside out. And considering the volume of data, I'm not sure what kind of information they're drawing out of it, but it seems like something like that might be a, Have you looked at that? 
Yeah, certainly for, um, we, you know, we've a lot of success with Power BI for visualization and certain types of analysis. Um, uh, the type of analysis they were doing here and the, the number of ways they were splitting and recombining just I, I don't think would really fit, but, um, but there are other tools out there that I think could, could fit into that, so yeah. Cool. All right. I know it's a few minutes early, but lunch. Okay. <laughs>